Hello, and welcome to Shelby Speaks, the concurrency of our classrooms. I'm Adam Watson, the Digital Learning Coordinator here at Shelby County Public Schools. The word concurrency in our vodcast title reflects the reality of many of our classrooms this school year. Classrooms that are a hybrid of students in person and students at home, often being facilitated by a teacher simultaneously, but is also an intentional nod to the idea of metaphorical currency in our instruction. In the spring of 2020, our educators were forced to pedagogically invest in new innovative strategies to effectively teach in an emergency distance learning environment. As spring became fall, we faced new challenges, and we are thankful for our spring 2020 investment in growing our learning. Our teachers are spending and trading the pedagogical capital built last school year in order to innovate and collaborate even further this school year. Part of that collaboration involved the creation of a district concurrent classroom Google Doc full of tips, resources, and videos where educators shared with each other how to navigate through our common challenges. It is selections from these videos that we are highlighting in our latest podcast series. In this episode, we hear from an EL instructor. Hannah Boyd is an educator at Martha Lane Collins High School. She shares not only the importance of co-teaching in a concurrent classroom model, but strategies and tips on how to do it effectively. Hello. So um, I'm just going to talk a, a bit about co-teaching real quick. Um, just to start, I am not an expert on co-teaching. However, I have been blessed to have some opportunities to do so over the past couple of years um, in Ecuador, I was um, helping implement co-teaching with my student teachers that came down from the United States. They co-taught with Ecuadorian teachers. And during my time teaching to an elementary school in Ecuador, I also co-taught with Ecuadorian co-teachers and American co-teachers. And so now I have the privilege of co-teaching with Miss Cantu in this picture. So we co-teach Algebra 2 together during third and fourth period. And so um, a little funny note on it, you can see here in this picture, I am taking notes and I have not had Algebra 2 before. And so I am actually learning as I go. And so I take all the notes with the kids. I ask questions like they do and we're learning together. So I'm, I'm up there translating and learning at the same time. Um, just a, a few other thoughts about co-teaching before we start. There are several different types of co-teaching. You can uh, look it up. I, I think there's at least six different types that they talk about. Um, so one is while one, one is teaching, the other is supporting, or vice versa. Um, then there is one is teaching the whole group, one is pulling small groups and individuals. And so basically co-teaching, the idea is that both of you are teaching, um, and it's co, <laughs> it should be balanced. And so there are different models. I would say with our particular work with the EL population, it is better to be teaching either uh, simultaneously if you're doing translations, or um, I guess it wouldn't be simul well, simultaneously, yes, <laughs> um, or one where one is teaching the whole group and one is pulling individuals or small groups and that's probably what would work best but I'm sure there's other models that might work as well. So uh, my first recommendation for this is having an initial meeting with your co-teacher before you even start and so it's important to talk about your expectations and responsibilities going into it. Uh, you should talk about your previous experience with co-teaching because those set up naturally some expectations uh, for what is going to happen in this new co-teaching relationship. Um, so have they done it before? What worked well? What didn't? What would you, what do you expect from me? Like, what do you expect whenever you imagine us teaching together? What do you see me doing? And you should both express that. Um, then talk about what your experience and strengths are as an educator as well. That helps. So for example, whenever I met with Miss Cantu to start off, I told her about my experiences in Ecuador. I told her um, that I speak Spanish and how can we utilize those strengths. She told me that she understands a lot of Spanish and knows some too. So we've been able to incorporate both of our strengths into the class. Um, it's also good to, it's good to be upfront during this time about your expectations and, and your needs. So as a co-teacher, 
you might want to see the content or the work a certain amount of days in advance so that you can prepare, um, prepare, prepare vocabulary, translate something. And so it's important to tell them that and explain why too. So say, would it be possible to get, you know, the work at least two days before? So I can review it, translate it, simplify it, whatever. Um, and it's also good to get a feel for if it's going to be a shared classroom situation or not. So are you going to be able to uh, interact during the lessons or are you just kind of hanging back as the co-teacher? Are you able to hang up you know, a poster in the room if you need to? Um, is there a space for you on the board to do guided notes with the kids? And so kind of just asking some of those questions, thinking about what you might want to do and setting yourself up for that because it's not good to assume it's going to be a certain way because it probably will not be. So you need to talk about that before. Um, it's good to define responsibilities during this time as well. And so who is uh, making the differentiated materials for the EL kids? Who is responsible for that? Often this part goes um, undefined, and then either one person is mad because they're making everything, or nothing is, is being fixed and differentiated for the kids regarding assignments and homework and things like that and readings. So it's important to decide that first off. And also to talk about what is each person doing during the class hour? What does it look like? Is one of their teaching? It's one of their teaching, um, like the model that me and Miss Cantu use is I translate in live time. That works for us. Um, we decided to start off the school year like that, and so far we're continuing it because it's working well. She'll say, you know, maybe two or three sentences. I say it in Spanish. The kids like hearing it in both languages. They get it twice. Um, so what does that look like? For us, that looks like I'm taking notes, listening very, you know, I'm very concentrated in listening to Miss Cantu because I'm learning as well. Uh, and then, so I'm up there beside her, writing, translating. Does it, what does that look like for you? Maybe you're not in the front of the room. Okay, but kind of define what that looks like for your productive classroom. What is best? Maybe you're on the side of the room, uh, on the side, using a side whiteboard, writing uh, short shortened, simplified, guided notes for students with the main points of the lecture, if that's what's being given, or of the lesson, because they are going to have a hard time getting everything and understanding everything because it's in English. So what are you doing during the lesson to make it more comprehensible? That is also the job of the main teacher, but in this particular um, talk today, we'll be talking about what's our responsibility, okay, as the co-teacher and how we can start it off successfully. So lastly, I would suggest sharing student info, some short and concise information. And so I would recommend it being, you know, student name, maybe country, how long they've been in US, English level. Um, I would put anything that they need to know about the student. It could be the student has had severely interrupted education. They haven't been in school since third grade. It could be the student has had behavior problems, let's be proactive in helping prevent that. Um, I would also recommend putting the accommodations that the student has. Uh, while PSPs are important and they should be reviewed, I've had several teachers tell me that they do not review them. And so we should still encourage them to do so because that should be expected of them, but also realize that it's not always happening. So how can we help them still get the important information? All right, so the steps to co-teaching successfully, there are more than this, but this is a brief chat. <laughs> Having that initial meeting is very important, as explained in the previous slide. Um, another step would be to explain your role to the students. All right, what should they expect of each teacher? And um, Both teachers should have an active role. So just because I'm in my algebra class with the kids, that does not mean that Miss Cantu leaves those kids just to me. Okay, she does depend on the language part. She depends on me for the language part. But she equally, if the kids' hands are raised, she's popping over to them. She's building that relationship. She's using the Spanish words she knows to make connections with them, speaking slowly. So she herself is, is making that um, connection with the students. Um, and I think if, if you're translating every class, the kids should know that that's what you'll be doing. If that's not what you're doing, that's fine. It depends on how you've decided to do the co-teaching. 
uh, maybe you've decided, okay, during the class, uh, I want the kids to just listen um, and copy the guided notes that I am writing on this on the board. After at the end of class, we'll have a five or ten minute uh, small group where I explain to them, either in Spanish or in very simplified English, the main points of the class in case they missed them, in case they didn't get it. Okay, so they need to know what to expect of you. What is your role? What is the other teacher's role? And another thing would be to constantly reflect together as a team. And so um, the content teacher is obviously considering the content needs. What standards must be met? Uh, what do kids need to know? And I, and I and you all are constantly assessing the language needs. So how can I help the kids to get this math vocabulary? How can I make sure that the language, the English language, is not a barrier for their learning this algebra content? And so constantly thinking of that and figuring out how to improve on those together. So, for example, I am progressively using less Spanish or translating less for the kids. It depends. If it's a brand new topic, then I do a lot more Spanish. Uh, once we've practiced the, the topic for a while or that standard for a while, the kids are already becoming more familiar with the vocabulary that I squeeze in. I'll start using, uh, for, for example, the different factoring names in English only so that that's what they know. So I'll be speaking in Spanish but throwing in those keywords in English. Or, for example, if we're talking about squared or cubed a lot, I'll, do, I'll say al cuadrado, al cubo. But then I'll also say them in English at the same time, squared, cubed. So the kids are getting those words. Um, let's see. Also with the reflection, um, who needs to be pulled for small group support or individual support? And when is a good time to do so? All right. And what is working and not working in the class? So it could just be quick. It doesn't have to be a long meeting every week. It could just be right after class. Hey, we we did it today. We were right on it with the translating back and forth and with the supporting the kids. That works. Let's do it again tomorrow. Or some days it might be, oh, it was not good today. We need to do more practice problems tomorrow. We need to slow it down. Okay, and just just always reflecting very briefly. Might be one or two sentences in some cases. All right. Um, also, let's talk quickly about the use of Spanish in the room. Um, a lot of studies have shown that mixing native language with English is considered the most beneficial, especially when learning content. And so, what type of Spanish is useful? Well, um, it's not always helpful to translate everything into Spanish, right? If you have a very long, complex text in the language arts class. You translate that to Spanish, well, we know that a lot of our kids' reading levels in Spanish are also very low, so that not, will not necessarily benefit them. And so, um, in that case, it might would be better to find an alternative text, either very simplified English or even simplified Spanish, not just translating it. And we also know a lot of our kids don't speak Spanish as their first language, as their second language. And so, that's one thing to consider. Also, um, we should consider that if we just know a little bit of Spanish in some cases, if we're saying, for example, cinco in a math class, well, kids likely know what, what five is, and so that's not necessarily helping them. Um, it's better for us to think, use the words that they know in English in English, because they do need to practice, but consider what they likely don't know in English uh, in Spanish. That would be make more sense to use those Spanish words. Um, Spanish is also very useful when you're co-teaching to draw attention back to a topic. So let's say the kids are kind of spaced out, and then all of a sudden you say, ¿Y cuál es el próximo paso? And then they all, they all get refocused because they understand it. Okay, so it, it helps every once in a while to throw in a bit of Spanish to keep them focused. All right. Um, lastly, with NTI co-teaching ideas, um, it's recommended to have a WhatsApp group for your parents, the parents of the kids or the students themselves, to remind them of Zoom, to remind them of homework assignments that are coming up. Um, if you are doing live translation, you can continue that over Zoom if it's possible, if it's appropriate, if it doesn't slow down the pace of your class or make it boring, um, and if it's agreed upon with you and your co-teacher, you can continue that in Zoom. Um, encourage students to attend all of their classes for attendance, but 
know that they will not understand all of it, probably. <laughs> and you can send them a summary video afterwards. It could be um, in simplified English or it could be in Spanish if, if you're comfortable with that and have the level of Spanish needed. Um, review work of the, that the kids are given uh, on Google Classroom or whatever platform you're using. You could suggest to your co-teacher shortened assignments or help shorten them. Uh, you could suggest translate assignments or translate them yourself. Or you can, if you're confused with something on the assignment, your kids are going to be confused too. All right, so it's good to ask for clarification. Um, and then I have a note there, I already mentioned this, translated work is not always helpful um, because of those two things that we talked about before. So anyway, that's just very, very brief about co-teaching and how to do so successfully. Um, it is hard. It depends on who your co-teacher is to how open they are to all of this, but we need to keep trying to do our best. Just being in the room, you being present, and waiting for the kids to come to you is not always enough. And so we need to look for more ideas on how to, to improve that. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's it for now. Maybe I can do another one of these later. But thank you guys.